going to talk today about canine parvovirus and canine panleukopenia, and specifically some of the new ways we're using tests to assess what we are concerned could be outbreaks in our shelters. Um, and she talked a little bit about using antibody titers in respiratory disease testing, uh, specifically for distemper. And so I'm not talking about distemper today because I thought if I threw it into the mix, it just confuses things. How many of you have used any antibody testing for parvo or distemper, the CDB, CPV in your shelter? Okay, just a couple of people. When you start throwing that into the mix, it gets really confusing. So my other confession is that the reason I chose this topic is I find it to be a really difficult one to think through. And so I gave it to myself as a way of both thinking through it, reviewing the literature, and figuring out how to talk to you about it. So what I'm hoping is that by the end of this, you will walk away with some really practical information on how to use some newer tests or use older tests in a newer way. So here's an overview of what we're going to do. I'm going to do a very brief um, talk on managing an outbreak. And it'll be very brief. It was mostly the part to entertain myself, because I always have to do that when I have a talk. Um, I need the opportunity to put in some fun slides. And talking about sensitivity and specificity isn't as fun for me as it is for Jan. All right? <laughs> I'm just going to confess straight up. Um, canine and feline parvovirus, I'm going to talk almost nothing about the diseases themselves. So I figure you guys have that level of knowledge. I don't need to go through the diseases. Um, then we're going to do a brief immunology, uh, immunology 101, I think maybe two or three slides worth, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then talk about newish diagnostics. And that's the part where I hope that we can give you some new tools and new ways to think about them. And then a few other methods of prevention when it comes to canine and feline parvovirus in our shelters. And then a few questions that remain. So we're going to get that all done and we're going to get out of here on time. I promise. So outbreak identification and investigation. So definition of an outbreak, Jan already set me up, uh, Miranda already set me up. Disease incident is in excess of what is usually present. So I hope that this might look like an outbreak of cats to you, <laughs> and that this is not something that is part of your daily activity, all right? So can we all kind of agree that this might be in excess of what we hope we have? Okay, good. So, and then I thought about this, because I was trying to define outbreaks. And outbreaks sound really sexy, right? Like outbreaks, you know, and then the investigators come in, and boy, vets are really cool. And I remembered this, which went viral on Facebook a while back. <laughs> so veterinarians, what my friends think I do, what my parents think I do, what my patients think I do, what my clients think I do, what I think I do, how many people feel like that. And then what I really do, which is really what we do, right? A lot of times, late night, looking things up, when everybody else has gone home, and the last person in the shelter is the LVT or the veterinarian thinking, oh, what are we going to do with this case? So yeah, exactly. So here's what people think you do in an outbreak, all right? You call Dustin Hoffman, you put on a fancy <laughs> outfit, and you go investigate like Mr. Detective. It sounds really sexy, but the truth is, this is what you think you do, right? Oh my God, I'm freaking out. There's parvovirus in the kennel, I'm freaking out. And that's pretty much what I feel like. And then what you actually do is a series of maybe not so exciting steps to prepare for that. So you prepare for your investigation of the outbreak, confirm that it actually exists, important, clarify what the actual diagnosis is of the disease, define and figure out who's involved, characterize the cases. So this is our detective, right? Who, when, where, how did this happen? Um, perform a risk assessment, and that's a big part of what I'm going to talk about today because I'm going to talk about how can we use other things to try and decide what patients are most at risk. Then we separate or segregate them according to that risk, isolate the affected, quarantine those exposed, develop control and prevention measures, monitor success and failures, because as much work as we do to define the risk and to separate animals, there will be some that fool us and throw off our entire plan, darn it. And so it's important that we're really watching our success and our failures. Maybe we have to refine our plan. Really important in an outbreak situation to communicate what's going on to everyone, everyone in your organization and maybe outside your organization, and then establish your conclusions. Note, this is more what it looks like, that poor guy sitting at his desk, right, um, with the desk lamp on, because it just takes this amount of time and thinking and planning. So being prepared means having pre-existing protocols. 
So things that you should do when an outbreak happens. You should segregate, segregate clinically ill animals immediately, and that came up earlier um, in talking about respiratory disease. If they have signs of clinical illness, they should be separated. And that can be the tricky part in finding space, but somebody had a great suggestion about maybe you need to segregate your animals to foster care if you don't have a place to segregate them in the shelter and you have a system in your shelter that will allow that. And that was a suggestion that came from the audience. Maybe you need to investigate in diagnostics up front, and Dr. Spindell set us up great for that too. It's sometimes it's a lot more cost effective to spend the money on the diagnostics now so that we can properly attack this situation rather than trying some things and then having them not work out. So I'm a big fan of really kind of choosing cost effective diagnostics. You do need to strictly adhere to your cleaning protocols and that means you have cleaning protocols in place, people know them, they've been trained on them, and you're gonna be strict about them. You do need to establish rational traffic patterns. So people should move from healthy to vulnerable, they should move from young to old, they should, the clinically ill should keep their own staff whenever possible so that your healthy animals and your sick animals aren't being cared for by the same staff. And that can be a real challenge. It may mean getting some volunteers on board to help with that. It may mean that somebody's the dirty girl all week dealing with the parvo puppies and that's all she does. <laughs> and she wears trash bags a lot. Like, that happens. Um, I've been there, unfortunately. Do consider restricting entry of new animals, if at all possible, in a situation like this while you get things under control. If you're able to do that, recognizing that some of you, and I know there's quite a few of you from municipal shelters that may not have the ability to do that, do consider open communication early to the public and volunteers. Now, I wouldn't go out there, you know, being chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but once you've had a second to kind of sit down, think about it, realize, yes, I have an outbreak, yes, this is a problem, communicate it, don't try to hide it, because the word gets out there, for sure. Enlist help, big time. Call people, call people that you need for medical advice. Call volunteers in who are particularly good volunteers that can help you with, with situations. Enlist help. And this is my personal one. I always like to think through the worst case scenario and the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, where could this be going? What could it look like? And what should I be thinking about? Often, my mind goes to that first. So I tend to be a little pessimistic. And then the best case scenario, maybe this isn't ringworm at all. I'm gonna treat it like it is, but wouldn't it be great if I did these diagnostics and it wasn't, and I did this, you know, I prepared anyway. Um, so both of those things I think through, and then I essentially start working towards the worst case pro uh, scenario until I prove otherwise. So performing a risk assessment, figuring out which patients are most at risk so that you can then make choices based on that. So our low risk patients in the shelter and our high risk patients or indeterminate, I put them in with the high risk in this, in this picture. So those that are immune are at low risk of getting the disease. Can we all agree on that? Sure. Those that are not exposed, at least as far as we know, are at low risk for getting the disease. Fair enough? Good, we love those guys. All right, they're the easy part. Now we get to our higher indeterminate risk, our clinically recovered. They've had the disease, so their risk, of, their risk is, I would say, indeterminate until we really figure out, figure out shedding periods. So they're a little bit fuzzy. The big question there is when can they become low risk and when can we put them on the adoption floor? And that's a question I get a lot um, when people call me. So the clinically recovered are a bit of a conundrum. The potentially exposed, um, are certainly a bit of a conundrum. Who was exposed and what does that mean and how do I decide if they're really at risk or not? I don't want to necessarily leave them with the ill animals and continue their exposure, but what do I do with them? And then obviously the clinically affected are our high risk patients. And because it also determines what are we gonna do with them. So our not exposed animals, we're probably gonna wanna move them along, get them away from the other animals and adopt them out. Fair enough? And our immune animals, let's get them out of here. Let's get them on the adoption floor like we can. Our clinically ill, we're gonna isolate in our isolation ward. Our potentially exposed, we're gonna quarantine and monitor um, to make sure that they don't develop signs. And our clinically recovered, we're gonna to move to adoption. Now it sounds super easy, but this is the part I think we struggle with. Our clinically ill are relatively easy um, and maybe our not exposed are relatively easy. We haven't necessarily known who's immune, right? Parvovirus, pan-luke, we can make some judgment calls, but we don't really know for sure. 
And so in doing a risk assessment, these are the guys that, uh, these are the guys that can certainly be a concern to try and figure out who they are and when they're going to be free to go. So here's my very, very brief couple of slides on the diseases themselves. So parvovirus, the most important basics I wanted you to have at the top of your mind, yes, we all know the clinical signs. So parvovirus in cats and dogs, GI signs, do remember they can be less specific than that. So lethargy, anorexia, just not eating, early, early signs that there could be a problem, especially if you know you already have affected animals. Leukopenia, a drop in white blood cells. Do we have to send something to a lab to know that? No, you may be able to do a blood smear right in your shelter. And I wanna say it was Dr. Spindel years ago who I, had, I heard say this in talking specifically about parvovirus. Don't forget the value of the blood smear if you have a question about whether you have active disease. Sudden death can be a real indication, especially for, um, especially for kittens. So a kitten that suddenly dies overnight in your shelter is panleukopenia till proven otherwise. And that can be true for parvovirus as well because in puppies, and I don't know if everybody remembers this, but it affects rapidly devaluing cells. And so there are some puppies that get a myocarditis from, from parvo, and that's their indication. And they just die, they drop dead in the cage. Um, and so, and then kittens, we have the variety where they get the cerebellar disease and, and neuro. It's a very uh, tough virus to kill, non-envelope virus, very tough to kill. And it's, also anagenically stable. So our vaccines are really reliable. So we feel pretty good about animals that have been vaccinated. But unlike animals in practice, where you have a vaccination record, so many of our animals, we just don't know. We don't know if they were vaccinated or not. Um, but what we can trust is that for these diseases, unlike a lot of our respiratory diseases, if they were vaccinated and they mounted an immune response, chances are they're immune from getting the disease at all, which is great. Um, remembering incubation and shedding periods, because in an outbreak situation, these are your key numbers, okay? So incubation period for parvovirus, um, from the time they get the disease to the time they are showing signs of disease can be between two and 14 days. That's what it's been reported to be. We think on average, it's probably closer in that five to seven window, um, but that is, that is how widely it's been reported. And then their shedding periods can be two days prior to signs, for dogs, that's really tricky. Oh, we don't like that um, because they're shedding and they're not even showing signs of illness yet. And 14 days after recovery is what we most commonly think of. There have been some studies done that may have indicated um, tests beyond that, but the co most common is 14 days and we do think they're resolved. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can probably monitor that. Panleukopenia, um, same kind of idea. So the incubation period, a little bit shorter, two to 10 days is what we talk about. And the shedding can occur up to six weeks after recovery, six weeks. But on average, we think three weeks is a lot more common, so 21 days. Well, that's, I'm gonna talk about that. So you're talking about using the antigen test to test. The antigen test is fairly reliable for testing on shedding. So you may be able to use that to monitor shedding. I don't know that there's been any good clinical trials on it, but we've used it. We've tested our parvo puppies at 10 days to see, and if they've tested negative on a fecal antigen test, then we've considered them to not be shedding. Keep in mind that shedding can be intermittent, so you take a risk. So I wouldn't go picking up that puppy and running into the puppy room and dropping it in the middle of all its friends. <laughs> like, I wouldn't handle it that way. But it does help me feel better about moving that dog along, and I'm gonna talk about that as we move along um, in the presentation. So, challenges in diagnosis and testing for these diseases. <laughs> the signs are nonspecific. Right? GI disease, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, anorexia, like how many other reasons could we come up for that? A lot in our animals. The cost of a misdiagnosis is super high. We miss that first one and it's interacting with the rest of our population or we don't have good biosecurity measures in place and we have an outbreak. Testing can be confounded by vaccination. So a lot of the tests, um, PCR testing, serology testing, it's con it can be confounded or even the antigen testing can be confounded by vaccination. And so we may be looking at testing for something that we vaccinated against, and now we're not quite sure what the results mean. Affected animals can be um, shedding prior to showing signs, or even without showing signs, and those subclinical animals are always a big worry. And I don't have the magic bullet for those subclinical animals, 
But again, as we do a risk assessment, the goal is, is that we're going to minimize the chances of the, as if everybody is really watching those animals and watching for subtle signs like lethargy and off food, then we're going to be better off catching the animals that are, that are very subtle. So the canine parvovirus ELISA test. So this is an antigen test. So what you're looking for are viral particles in the feces. And what we do know is that direct rectal swabs are more sensitive. So you're better off putting the swab up the tushy than you are sticking it in the pile of poop, okay? So it's more important to actually get a test directly from the animal. Um, it's controversial. Do light positives occur in response to vaccination? That's the question I get a lot. I've got this light positive. Is it because I vaccinated this dog against parvovirus five days ago? Is it because I vaccinated this kitten against panleukopenia five days ago? Schultz's study in 2008 says no, with IDEX you don't get false positives. If you get a positive, it is truly positive. That was in a, I want to say the number of tests done there were in the 64 dogs or something. So it was somewhere in that range, somewhere in the 60s um, for numbers of animals tested. A study in 2007 by Larson said, yeah, sometimes you do. Sometimes you do get false positives. And it depends on which test you're using. So the IDEX test may be, may be a little bit better in these cases in terms of not giving you a false, light false positive in response to vaccination. But I think that you really have to take this into account and judge also based on clinical signs. So if you vaccinated the animal, and the animal is now showing signs, and it comes up positive on the antigen test, at that moment, I think to myself, uh-oh, this kitten could have panleukopenia. So what am I going to do with it? I'm going to isolate it. I'm not going to take the chance. I'm not going to dismiss it as a vaccinal, but I'm going to isolate it. Now, what if that kitten, you know, it, it was lethargic and, and such. We give it a little supportive care, and it's bouncing all around the room, la di da di da you know, within 24 to 48 hours. I might be less inclined to be completely freaking out about, about an outbreak. I'm certainly going to watch the litter mates, who I probably quarantined with that kitten, to see what they do. Um, but, but I would not say to um, completely rule out the idea that a vaccine could cause a false positive, because I really do believe they do. Um, you can use this as well for feline panleukopenia testing. Most of you are probably doing that, yes? Using the canine parvovirus test? Yep. Um, and the concern is, is that yes, indeed, you do see some false positives with vaccination in doing that. And so particularly for your kittens, if you use the canine parvovirus ELISA, you may get false positives post-vaccination. The kittens tend to do fine. I still isolate them and see what happens and provide them with supportive care. If I isolate them and one gets sicker and sicker and dies, then certainly I'm a lot more concerned and I send that for necropsy and histopathology to confirm it so that then I know I, we can start tracing back. Um, the other thing this speaks to, I mean, I didn't mean to talk about this, but I'm going to put it in here right now, is that I'm not a big believer in mixing litters of kittens. And I smile only because some of you have had this conversation with me over and over and over again. Um, with the onset of communal cat housing and this movement towards more communal housing, it can be really tempting to kind of create kitten festival in one of your communal cat rooms or kind of mix all the litters in because it's fun. It's fun to watch them all jump around and there's 15 kittens in a room. But I really wouldn't recommend it for all sorts of reasons. And this is another good one. Um, not to do that. And I prefer to keep them segregated by litter. And that includes in foster homes. It makes managing this stuff a lot easier. And it's safer for them, quite frankly. All right, so Immunology 101. I promised it would be short, so let's see how I do. It's, I'm going to call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right, so here's the good thing about immunology and related to parvo and feline panleukopenia. In both cases of these diseases, the vaccines are extremely effective at preventing disease. Modified live vaccinations are much more successful in a shorter period of time, and that's what you should use in shelters. And I'm sure all of you know that because you've heard it over and over and over again. The bad. The prevalence of protective antibodies in animals against these diseases in shelters can vary. And so our animals come to us with very differing levels of prevalence. And that's true, that's very different from animals that are being seen in veterinary clinics, because I'll have the figures for you on that. The prevalence of protective antibodies against these diseases, parvovirus and panleukopenia, 
for the animals entering our shelters are surprisingly low. So quite a few of them come to us with no protection on board, even adult animals, where we would suspect that they should have either been vaccinated or had natural immunity. And that is simply not the case. And then the ugly. In young animals, what complicates the picture, as you know, is that maternal antibodies can interfere with the vaccination. And so their maternal antibodies are essentially interfering with our ability to vaccinate them, and therefore they don't have protective immunity. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So there's the good. Um, the good about modified live vaccines. Um, the modified live parvovirus vaccine is very, very effective. Protective immunity in challenge studies develops within days. So you're looking at within three to five days, dogs then given parvovirus don't develop parvovirus. Their antibody titers may not reflect that, but they were protected against disease. Um, and that was demonstrated by, and all these studies are at the end so that you can look at the literature yourself. Um, but with no, as long as they had no maternal antibodies in a challenge study, immunity was verified in 98 to 99% of dogs exposed to parvovirus after a parvovirus modified live vaccination. The feline panleukopenia vaccine, modified live, is very effective. Protection was demonstrated within one to two days through the introduction of positive cats to cats that were just vaccinated. And so what they were trying to do there is actually mimic, rather than giving these cats a giant bowl of panleukopenia, they were trying to just introduce positive cats into the environment, which is probably more along the lines of how our cats actually get sick, right? We hope we're not serving it for dinner but they're coming into contact with it through fomites, et cetera. In another study, detectable serum antibodies were present in five to seven days, but protection against the disease occurs earlier. So they are actually protected earlier than their antibodies may reflect. So for both of these diseases, in private practice, we've started talking about going to longer and longer periods between vaccine, right? Or using titers to check serum antibodies in animals and then decide whether to vaccinate them. And so that's how we've talked about using titers in practice. The bad is, is that our shelter animals may not have equal protection against parvovirus. So this is a prevalent study in, for animals, for dogs that entered vet hospitals, not shelter animals. So owned, client-owned animals coming to vet shelters. Large study, 1,441 dogs. 95% of them had a protective antibody titer against parvo. Their titer reflected that they were protected. 95% of the population of those dogs entering those vet hospitals. Study in Florida relatively recently, 431 dogs coming into a municipal shelter. Only 57% of those dogs had a protective antibody titer. So we used to think, well, you know, if a dog's a year old, it's protected. It had to have come into contact with parvo out there somewhere, or it had to have gotten a vaccine somewhere along the line. But the truth is that's simply not true. 57% of them had protective antibodies against parvo. The prevalence of protective antibodies to feline panleukopenia is worse in terms of the protection being, um, being on board. So here's a serological survey of cats entering shelters. Um, a study done by Schultz, not published, but he reported about half the cats. Half the cats would get fan, feline, pan, feline panleukopenia. They were not protected, either by vaccine or natural immunity. A more recent study of 356 cats and, cat, cats and kittens entering three Florida shelters, 41% of them, only 41% had protective antibodies against fe, fe, uh, feline panleukopenia. And these are adult cats. We're not, just, we're not talking about itty-bitty babies. So 60% of those cats were susceptible, adult cats. Similar study of 61 feral cats in Florida, only a third of them had protective antibodies to feline panleukopenia. And again, we used to kind of believe, well, they get exposed out there in the colony, and if they make it through, well, then they have natural immunity. But they really don't. So they're very sensitive if they come into our shelters. So overall, and not surprisingly, cats are less protected than dogs against par parvovirus. It, I don't know, and that's an excellent question. Um, there have been some studies, there are recent prevalent studies that are coming out of Chicago, and they are equivalent. They're not any better. Um, and in so many places, we just don't know because the work's not getting done. Um, but those, those are the more recent ones. I would love to know around here personally, but you know, it takes time and, and money 
um, for this testing? And so that's always the question. So it's a good question. So how many people are familiar with this, have seen this before, and wish I wasn't putting it up here? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand, so now I'm going to talk about it. All right, now you have to listen. So this is our ugly. Here's the ugly. Maternal antibodies are a blessing and a curse. So here are the years of age, from 0 to 16, not years, weeks. 0 to 16 weeks of age. Um, and here's the log of our antibody titers. So if we do an antibody titer on these animals, if animals get maternal antibodies, from their mothers, those maternal antibodies are in a steady decline over the course somewhere within this range. So some of them may have um, antibodies out beyond 16 weeks, a so very few of them. Others may lose them as early as nine weeks, and some don't ever get them. Fair enough. So some of them may not have any. If, if their mothers weren't either immunized or had natural exposure. Um, and so those protective antibodies from the mother are in a state of decline. This is the line of what you need to block virulent virus if that animal is exposed to disease. This is the line of what you need to block the vaccination that we're trying to give to protect the animal. So even if they have, if they have, let's just go to one, they, at this point, they have sufficient maternal antibodies to block the vaccination, but they do not have sufficient antibodies to protect them against disease. So our vaccine isn't helping them, and their mom isn't helping them. And so we have this period of time, and it really does run around 8 to 12 weeks, 8 to 11 weeks, a window susceptibility when they are highly susceptible to disease. Now, if, they never, if their mother didn't have antibodies and they didn't inherit any, they're not protected at all from day one. But what we think is that actually that allows our vaccines to work more effectively earlier, right? And so it's a blessing and a curse because those maternal antibodies give them protection early on, but impact our ability to help them gain their own protection right about the time they're hanging out in our shelter. Fair enough? And so I really have mixed feelings about mom. I really do. <laughs> there are times when I'm like, you know, maybe mom's a bad idea. But um, it's right about that time. It's just like it was set up to get us, right? No matter what we do, vaccinate, we can't win. Um, let them get great colostrum, we can't win. Like this is the period of time when things are most susceptible. And the sad thing I'm going to tell you is I don't have a magic answer for that today. But, but I've got some thoughts. Let's hope they're good ones. So back to our risk assessment. What we need to do is decide the, for these guys. These are our challenges. Who's immune? Who was potentially exposed? And what are we going to do with our clinically recovered? Because our clinically affected are going to have a plan, and our not exposed have a plan. What have we done traditionally? We've assessed by signalment, right? So we get out our pencils and our reading glasses, and we start looking at our animals, and we say, hmm, all right. So who's very low risk? Well, we, we used to believe our adults, because you know, if they're fully vaccinated and we vaccinated them, they probably are low risk. If we vaccinated them, most of them will have mounted an immune response. All of them? Not necessarily. Um, Schultz says uh, that there are some animals, particularly dogs, that will not necessarily launch an immune response specifically to distemper, even if we give them multiple vaccinations. That there are some animals that genetically have a hard time launching protection to canine parvovirus. Although the, the feeling is now, remember when we always talked about Rotties being more susceptible and all of that, and Dobermans? The general feeling there is that that may not hold true any longer because there's been kind of a natural decline in those genetic, the genetic um, defect or whatever it was that didn't allow those dogs to mount immune response. So the general feeling is that doesn't hold true anymore, that we may, those guys may have essentially died off. But we, can't, <laughs> but we can't say for sure um, that our adults are protected unless we vaccinated them and then we feel a lot better. Okay, we've had this dog, it's been here a month, it's fully vaccinated, they're pretty low risk. Signalment. Well, low risk. Adults and puppies greater than four or five months old with one vaccine on board at least one week. Because of those, some of those challenge studies, we feel pretty good that those guys are essentially low risk. Our vaccines are really good at providing protective immunity now. And if their puppies are more than four or five months, those maternal antibodies should have waned. And so they should be pretty safe. 
So I'm going to call them low risk just based on signalment. Moderate risk. Vaccinated puppies under four months of age. They're getting scary, okay? So we need to assess where were they um, and who have they come in contact with. But no matter who they are and no matter where they've been, they're still at moderate risk of getting exposed. Uh, because even if we've kept them out of our shelter and they've been in foster, there's been some level of interaction, most likely with our shelter. So they're still moderate. High risk, actually all unvaccinated puppies, and I'd say dogs, are at risk. Anybody who's unvaccinated or has an unknown vaccine status by signalment, yes? That's a great question. So what she asked is, do you look at whether they're altered? So let's say we don't have a history, they came in as a stray, but they've been altered. And my answer is yes, and there is data to support that. Um, so one of the more recent prevalent studies that came out from PAWS, and I'm looking at whoever asked me about other regions of the country, the numbers are pretty low on that. But 100% of the altered animals entering into those shelters had protective antibodies for distemper and parvo. They're looking specifically at dogs there. And so that seems to say that we could look at our altered animals and feel that they're low risk, maybe even very low risk, because chances are they've had at least one vaccine on board, and chances are that's going to protect them against these diseases. So that's a good thought. Excellent question. Any others at this point? This is hard stuff. You guys are hanging in there. All right. Extreme risk, litter mates of affected puppies or kittens. I was a little dog specific here, but um, I kind of, I think I meant to do that. There's some differences. But litter mates of affected animals, absolutely extreme high risk. Okay, so we've traditionally done our risk assessment by signalment and logic and our pencils and pieces of paper. What we can do is start to use these tests. So there's the symbiotics titer check, which is distemper parvo, ELISA, and there's a I don't know if it's BioGal or BioGal. Do you know how to pronounce that, Miranda? Okay. Um, people call it the comb test or vaxi check test. Um, we can start to look at these because they are cage side tests that give us the antibody level in the animal. So how are they different? Cage side. So it's in the same moment of time. We can do it in the shelter. It takes about 30 minutes and I'll talk about some of the details of the testing. But we don't have to send things out to a lab and we don't have to wait for the three or four days because we need to make decisions about segregating animals and even bathing and segregating animals at the moment. If we have to wait three, five, seven days for results, that animal's exposure could have changed in that time. Fair enough? And I'm like a practical drill sergeant person. I like to get the result, make a decision, and move things along. Like that's how I work. So this works for me. Now, it's not perfect, and we're going to talk about the dynamics of it, but it is an interesting test. The other thing I found, because I think about this as something new for us in shelters, it's like the new thing we're talking about is how to use these tests. But the truth is, is that this comb test, the vaccine check test, it's been around for a long time, was actually first studied in 1996 at the Baker Institute, and what it was studied was for using it in private practice to assess antibody tests or antibody levels in annual exams to decide whether we had to revaccinate. So that was our, the more pressing question at that point, was do we need to revaccinate animals annually? And we've done that work, and now we know in private practice you probably don't have to, right? But we've taken this, and now the question is, can we use it in shelters and how, so, um, in terms of looking at populations and an outbreak? Do note that neither of these CDV, the dis canine distemper or canine parvo ELISAs, it's a combination test, so they come, in, they come together, they are not appropriate for testing feline pan leukopenia. So there has been some talk of trying to use the VAXI check um, to do that. A recent pilot study that was done um, by Brian DeGange has shown that the sensitivity for that was 28%, which means low sensitivity means you're going to have a high rate of false, po or false negatives. And I'm going to go through this because it always gets me. So low sensitivity, you're going to have a high rate of false negatives. 28% sensitivity is just not acceptable. So these tests do not work for the cat, but I'll tell you what's coming down the pike for the cat. So cost of testing ranges between $10 to $14, um, as long as you batch them. They can be labor intensive, um, especially while you're training people. It's not as easy as a snap test, 
Okay? So it's a well test. This is the comb test. So there's multiple wells. Um, this is the other, this is symbiotics. Um, and the, it's a color metric test. So the reading can be tricky. So already people are like, ah, I'm going to give you a big secret. It's not that much of a secret and it's very exciting. You can watch videos on how to run these tests and they're real time, real time videos. So your technician or the people running them are going to need 20 to 30 minutes when they run these. You can watch these videos at Maddie's Institute. You go to a webinar called Saving, Antibody, Saving Lives by Antibody Titers by Ron Schultz, and he was kind enough to have his technician run each of those tests and demonstrate step by step how to do it. So they don't even have to read that horrible pamphlet that unfolds <laughs> across the desk, and they're rolling their eyes at you, and you're, they're like, what do I do? How many drops? Um, and the other thing is that with color metric reading, it can be tricky because you're looking at gradations of color across. There is software that's available to help read these as well. And it has been demonstrated that the software may be slightly more accurate than the human eye in, in doing these. But it was only slightly more. Somebody who's trained and who has practiced can read these tests. And the technicians are all like, oh god, why did you have to even bring this up? I can see what I'm going to have to do now. Um, Important to recognize, 10 to $14 per test, yeah, it's going to cost you some money. And you do have to buy them essentially in boxes of larger numbers. But it's likely to be cheaper than quarantining all exposed populations. Because what this is going to do is tell you who is immune, who can I move along. And that can be a really valuable question. Everything about a test is about interpreting that test. So here's what you need to remember, and this is what I find so confusing, because most of the time with the testing that we do for diseases, we think of positive as bad, because they're positive for disease, right? That's not what we do with antibody testing. And so when it comes to protective antibody testing, a positive result is good. Positive means protected. So sensitivity of the test, because I'm going to talk about the various sensitivities and specificities for these tests to convince you that they're good tests. When sensitivity is high, you are minimizing false negatives. So how do I interpret that? A negative test means that the animal is at risk of contracting the disease. Okay. With specificity, when it's high, we are minimizing false positives. And so a positive disease can be trusted, and those animals are protected when we have a high specificity in our testing. Everybody with me? All right. That's the hardest part. From here, it's easy. OK. So how good are these tests when compared to laboratory tests? If we're going to buy these cage side tests and we're going to do them, how good are they? So the titer check versus a commercial lab, um, the kind that you might send to, where Antec, IDEX, one of those commercial labs. This test, this was 431 dogs, and that's important to me. I want to know how many dogs were tested in a study, because that's going to impact how I interpret it. 431 dogs were tested on admission to a shelter in Florida. The samples were submitted to a diagnostic lab, and this is a criterion referenced, which usually means an academic lab. Uh, diagnostic labs often have higher requirements for the accuracy of their tests. A commercial lab for IFA, and then used in the titer check microwells. The titer check had a higher specificity for canine parvovirus than the IFA, so better than the commercial lab. And it had a similar sensitivity, so low numbers of false negatives, to the IFA. So it's as good, if not better, than the IFA test. Not quite as good as the Criterion Reference Diagnostic Lab. But if you've used them, those guys can take a while to get your results back. And so I think it's really negligible, because these are really good. Specificity of 98%, sensitivity of 98% good. So we're going to have very few false positives, which means we're going to have very few animals that test as being protected but aren't. right? And we're going to have low numbers of false negatives, which means we're going to have very few animals that aren't protected that test is protected. So this is good. It's about 25% of the reference lab cost, which is fantastic. 
But it's a greater labor investment, and it requires a proficient technician who has learned how to read that test, or you learning to read that test. So there's your investment, but it's actually cheaper. Um, however, I've already said this, results in 30 minutes, so your decision making can already start, and you're not waiting and worrying about what's happening in the time between um, your sample going out and your results coming back. But then what do we do? Because it's all about the interpretation. And this is where there's a lot of questions, and there are still questions. I don't have the perfect answers. I don't think anybody does. And that actually brought me comfort as I try to wrestle through these situations. I don't know that we know exactly what to do, but this is where we're thinking. So if they are positive for protective antibodies, they've got high titers, and they are adult dogs, we're going to bathe them because we don't want them to carry the parvovirus off on their coats or their panluc off on their coats, although I hate to think about we're going to talk about dogs now. Um, we're going to bathe the dogs, <laughs> and we're going to move them along to adoption. All right, we're talking about dogs. Negative for protective antibodies, meaning their antibody titers aren't high enough to protect them against disease. Mm, maybe we want to confirm that they were vaccinated. Uh, maybe we want to revaccinate them. We're probably going to consider quarantining them for a period of time because they're not protected against disease. And remember, they could not be showing signs right now, but they could have been exposed. They could even be shedding, right? We want to monitor them closely for signs of disease, and vigilance is absolutely key. And we want to prevent new exposure to disease. Maybe we have to think of, we need to come up with a quarantine ward somewhere, somehow. And we need to quarantine them. We want to make sure we're cleaning and disinfecting, we're controlling our staff and all of the fomites, and we do want to remember to bathe them before introducing them back to the shelter so they're not carrying any disease on them. Affected animals? I'm sorry? What do we bathe with? Good question. So lots of talk with parvovirus in terms of what do we bathe with? What will kill it? And you know, what kills parvo? Bleach. Can we bleach the dogs? Please don't. People have done it. I don't recommend it. Please don't bleach the dogs. Um, there, is, there are newer products, accelerated hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide being one, and they do make a shampoo. I have yet to see an independent clinical study on that efficacy of that. But what I really believe, and this fits with, how many of any of you on the ringworm, um, ringworm webinar Thursday night, Maddie's fun? No, okay, you need to be. You need to see it. You need to catch it as soon as the recording goes online. because. For ringworm, Dr. Moriello, one of the, the dermatologists, board certified dermatologist who was talking about ringworm, ringworm scares you more than parvo? Yeah? How many people are more scared of ringworm than parvo? How many people are more scared of parvo than ringworm? Oh, it's 50-50. Okay. Ringworm actually scares me a bit more. But, you know, that's the one we think about, can't kill it, can't kill it. It's in the air, it's in the environment. What are we going to use? You know, how do we bleach everything in the room 1 to 10? And what she said and what she's got information coming out on is that you don't really have to bleach everything. You need to clean everything. And everybody always says, what cleaners? She actually did a lovely study where she sent everybody out to the grocery store to buy a variety of cleaners and just clean with them and see. And the truth is the cleaning, the mechanical cleaning and scrubbing was the most important part. And it didn't really matter what you used. And I'm going to say that I think the, it's probably the same for the dogs with bathing them. What's important is that we do bathe them. Dilution is the solution. Suds them up and bathe them. Um, don't bleach them. Certainly hydrogen, the accelerated hydrogen peroxide products aren't going to be a bad idea, but I would do a good suds, 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 and rinse. I think that's probably the most important thing. And just don't forget to bathe them. Okay. Affected animals, strict isolation and removal from the population. We have got to get them isolated away from the other animals. And recovered animals, what I'm going to say we do is we quarantine them until the shedding period is complete. Can we use the ELISA antigen test to help us with that? Yes, I think we can. So I retest them at 10 days and see what I get. I also look at their clinical signs. How sick were they? Um, how bad was it? And if the antigen test comes up negative and they look pretty good, what do I do first? Bathe them. And then I go ahead and I think about the best pathway to move them towards adoption. And that may not mean sticking them in with a bunch of other puppies. There may be a different pathway to adoption, but I feel safe getting them to adoption. Yeah? So if we have a positive that is, it was, if you're seeing clinical signs, it was, mm -hmm. recently, it was tested and it's positive. Yep. Right. 
yep. caution. But yep. Still being walked around. Mm -hmm. right? Like you said, there can be intermittent. There can be intermittent shedding. So yep. That means that we could potentially test it two days later and get it positive. It's possible. It's possible. I've never had that happen, but it's possible in theory. So again, I would be smart about where that dog walked around. Um, and the four to five days. I'd probably feel, I know that Karen, who works with me over at Tompkins, would probably be really anxious about my four to five days if I bumped that puppy over. Um, but if you're testing and, and it's coming up negative, it's not shedding at least for that test. It could be intermittent. So I'd say it's a judgment call. Again, nothing's perfect. You take a risk, but take a smart risk and kind of strategize on where to put it. But a lot of these dogs may actually have parvo. Um, and bounce back really quickly because either their own immune system kicked in or something worked for them. Um, other of them, it's possible that you got a false positive on the ELISA. If they don't show you good clinical signs, just a little vomiting diarrhea that may have been worms, it could have been a false positive with the vaccination. I've had that happen too. So, what would help us? That there could be a false positive. Yeah. So what would help us distinguish that? What did I say earlier that Dr. Spindell taught me? Blood smear. Yeah, let's look at a blood smear on a dog. So we have a dog with a little vomiting diarrhea. We get a very, very light positive. We vaccinated it five days earlier. We're not convinced that it's parvo. Maybe it's the vaccine. Let's look at a blood smear and see what that looks like. If we've got a leukopenia, neutropenia, I'm more concerned for sure. I'm still going to treat it like a positive, but if it comes back around pretty quickly, I may be faster to move to the adoption floor. Okay. All right, so how should we use this testing? What can we do with this? In an outbreak situation, in a shelter, the clearest answer is that maybe we go ahead and we use one of these tests, either the Vaxi check or the titer check, all dogs over four months of age with potential and known exposure. And then we segregate them by the findings. So we can check all of our adult, essentially our dogs over four to five months of age. And the jury's still out on four versus five. When do maternal antibodies really disappear? I'm gonna shoot for the four months right there. Puppy titers. Puppy titers for antibody testing are not reliable for protection. Why? Because the test can count maternal antibodies and their own induced antibodies Add, essentially add them together and it'll look like they're protected but they're really not. The other thing is those maternal antibodies can drop really rapidly all of a sudden. It's not always that nice little line and so they may be protected today but not protected tomorrow if that protection is primarily maternal antibodies. So we don't really know what to do with these guys when it comes to using these tests. Now that's really frustrating because they're our hardest cases, right? Those are the ones where we really don't know what to do when we've got parvovirus and they're the perfect age for it. So having said this, is there a place for testing puppies? And this is the big question that we're kind of all kicking around. Um, and I've been back and forth with people on it too. If we do the titer testing and the levels are high, they're positive, is it likely that they are more protected than another puppy with a low titer? Probably. Whether it's maternal antibodies protecting them or induced antibodies from vaccination, if they're high, chances are they probably are more protected at that moment in time. And we've got that result at that moment in time. So I'm not gonna tell you, yeah, sure, move those dogs along, but I'm thinking about it. Like, it may really help us. At least it gives us information about that particular puppy. And maybe we do some kind of comparison on where it is a week from now or two weeks from now if we're still kind of struggling with this issue. Should we quarantine them for a shorter period once we get them out of any chance of exposure? Get them out of the environment and bathe them. We can probably quarantine them for a shorter period of time because at the point of exposure, they had really high antibody levels. I don't know that it's going to work 100% of the time, but that's the way we're, tr we're trying to think about this. If they have a lower negative titer, that's another good question. Because like what I told you, if they've got no antibodies from mom, they're much more likely to amount an immune response to our vaccines and relatively quickly, a protective immune response. And so in some ways, I sometimes think, well, those dogs are actually better off because we're testing them at this moment, they're negative, I'm vaccinating them, and they're most likely gonna be protected by that vaccine within the next week. And I don't have to worry about that window of susceptibility because we're coming up. And so that's another way to think about this. 
The other, position, the other place where we're thinking about using these and we're kind of kicking around ideas are transport programs for puppies because that's the other challenging thing. When we move puppies in large groups, and I know some of your shelters are probably doing this, that's when we really get nervous about parvo, right? Because they're shipping from the south where parvo levels may be higher. Um, they're shipping in one truck. As much as you try to control fomite, um, transfer, transfer in those programs, it's really hard. And so there may be information that we can collect by doing titers on these dogs when they arrive to us. It's something to think about. And again, I've got a lot of questions about this. Um, so I'm throwing my issues out to you, but it is something to think about. If we check them as they come into our shelter, what information does that give us in terms of their management and how we might want to attack it? Yeah. Okay, good. So she's asking about transport guidelines, which is a whole other ball of wax or a can of worms. Um, but when you're looking at transport programs, a lot of that stuff can really be affected by the missions of the organizations and the situation. But ideally, of course, the best age that, pe that shelters want puppies is eight to 10 weeks, right? Which may be the worst age for them. I like to see at least one vaccination on board already on for at least a week to two weeks. And I'd love to see puppies transport at 12 weeks of age, honestly. But understanding that in some of those source shelters, that could be, the, moving them earlier could be the difference between life or death. But having said that, I would much prefer to see a 12-week-old puppy on a transport than an eight-week-old puppy. And most of the veterinarians probably agree with me. Um, and so I think it needs to be at least one vaccine. Preferably, we're at the point of needing our second. And ideally, I'd like to see them three months old. But the world isn't always ideal. Um, and I think puppies are cute, too. I also think they're cute when they're not sick. <laughs> All right? Um, and I've been there. I'll, I'll just throw out five seconds here that I've been in the position of um, very active in, in transporting puppies out of Tennessee to the shelter I was working in. And I've been in that position of having the truckload of 43 puppies show up. And I had gone through and selected them carefully. We had guidelines carefully in place, vaccinations carefully in place. It was one week before Christmas. And a puppy got off that truck and broke with parvo. So I've been there. I've managed a parvo outbreak in 43 transport puppies. They didn't all get sick um, over my holiday. So I've been there. I feel your pain. Um, and you know, at that point, you're ready to say, forget it. I'm not taking anything under six months of age. I'm done. That's not the way to go about it either. Um, cleaning up after parvo, just to remind you, and because I have a finer point that you may not know, remember, yes, household bleach right, one to 32 is reliable. Remember that your quats aren't necessarily reliable, so Parvosol, not reliable, okay, against Parvo. Um, your D256s, your Kenosols, most of the stuff you have that have funky names and you don't know what it is, it's a quaternary ammonium and it's not reliable against Parvo or panleukopenia. Um, potassium, this is your trifectant and your Vircon, yes, they are good against Parvovirus and panleukopenia, yes. I don't know what TBC is, but we can, we can look at the label. I did, and I didn't even understand the chemical. Okay. Well, we should talk. I'd like to know what TBC is. Um, but so your quaternary ammonium is not reliable. Um, the dilute bleach, we've talked about that. Do tell your staff, make sure you know that dilute bleach after cleaning is what's, what you can use. You need to protect it from light. It needs to be in a dark bottle, not a translucent bottle. It needs to be made fresh daily or even twice daily. After a few hours, your bleach loses its efficacy. How many people know that? Okay, good. How many people didn't know that? And you're gonna go home and talk to people now, especially mobile clinics, sometimes the worst because they make up the trifectant, I've done it myself, and the bleach and it, it sits in a bottle and moves around, and it's not good after that first day. Um, there's a handy dandy bleach calculator, I included that for when you get the presentation. Accelerated hydrogen peroxide, anybody using this in their shelter? Okay, some of you have got it on board. It's much more expensive. It does have the shampoo variety that I talked about that you can use to bathe animals. We don't have good independent studies, although so far so good. It looks like it is effective against parvo, but you have to read the label carefully, and I just learned this. There are various formulations of it and various companies. So Oxivir is one of them. If you buy the concentration and mix it up, it's labeled against parvo. If you buy what's called the table spray, that comes already made in a bottle, it's not effective against parvo. 
and it's called exactly the same thing. So check your labels carefully. Okay, so the table spray, not effective, at least for Oxivir. So what happens next? Where do we go from here? Because I've thrown these, this testing at you and told you that I can't fix all your puppy problems, but I do hope I've given you something to think about, at least a way to think through the problem. Um, we do have a test coming for cats. I told you you can't use the dog test for cats. The same company that made the VaxiCheck has a VaxiCheck coming out for Parvo. It has low sensitivity for feline panleukopenia, protective titers. What this means is that you will have higher levels of false negatives. So you are going to have a significant number of animals that test as though they are not protected, but they are. Is this a problem? It depends on what you do with the, that information, I think. So the application is you're going to have protected cats, they're truly protected, that you may quarantine them. Or you might even euthanize them if that's how your shelter thinks about it. And that's a problem. So that worries me a bit in terms of the sensitivity. It does have sp high specificity. So if an animal tests positive, which means it's protected, you can trust that. So it means that you can easily look at those animals and say they are not a problem when it comes to this panleukopenia issue and they are protected. The bigger question is what are we going to do with those ones that test negative as if they're not protected? Because some of them, are quite, a lot of them will be. And so I think we have to be careful with how we use it. It's not currently available in the US. I called the company and we expect it next year. Okay? And remember, you can't use the dog test to test effectively. So is there a role for disease surveillance? I'm going to blow through this really quickly because it's time. Um, but, you know, there is a question. We don't have any way of really collecting good information on these most infectious diseases that we see in our shelters, and our shelters are reflective of our communities, which Dr. Spindell pointed out earlier. And so we don't have a good system. Australia actually just launched something not very long ago asking for voluntary reporting on canine distemper and canine parvo. And I was really surprised because in 10 months of this, one-third of the practices in Australia were using it, which shocked me, quite frankly. And they had over 1,300 cases reported. And so I read this and I thought, you know, I don't expect the veterinarians across America to be this good because, you know, the Australians, they get that year off, that gap year, and so they're much more diligent, I think, than we are. <laughs> but I wonder about our shelter vets. I wonder about you guys, if there isn't a place to start some kind of voluntary reporting just so we can see how our communities are being affected and get more information. You know, you say, well, here's a Florida study or here's a Chicago study. What about my area? What's the disease, you know, occurrence in my area? And so this was a question for me because I don't think it'd be that hard. And so I'm just tossing it out there. You know, in your spare time, think about it. Is there a role in our animal shelter community as we get more and more organized? Um, Another is, and again, Spindel, Dr. Spindell set me up perfectly, there are quite a few shelters I know that are using their data, their intake data, um, and especially ones connected to hospitals. And so they're looking, their hospitals that are connected to them are looking at where are our parvo cases occurring, where are our distemper cases occurring, where are panleukopenia cases occurring by zip code, and then sending their shelter staff, veterinarians, technicians out to do vaccination clinics in those zip codes. So San Francisco's doing that. They've been doing it for years and they have really good data on it and they've actually seen a drop in the incidence of cases coming to their hospital. And you know what was happening before? The animals were coming to their hospital because they're a shelter, shelter hospital, even though they are private. And they were essentially doing the work at subsidized cost or for free. Those were the parvo cases that they were treating for free. So they're actually being proactive to go out to those areas and vaccinate those animals because it's such a preventable disease. Paws Chicago has that going, somebody told me um, when I was up there talking earlier. And we've even started doing this here at Cornell. We're not targeting yet. We don't have zip codes. But we've started a program um, with a group in Syracuse that's been really concerned about the level of parvovirus in that area. And a lot of a uh, handful, I should say, of local veterinarians, including practice owners and Cornell alum, got together and said, we need to set up some vaccination clinics in these neighborhoods where we're at least anecdotally collecting more parvo calls, emergency calls. And so the students have been doing that. And these are actual pictures of students vaccinating parvos, cute, 
parvos, puppies <laughs> against parvo. So in conclusion, um, these tests may have a place in your shelter. Outbreaks, transport, other creative ideas, I think we're really at the point of exploring it. Feline tests are coming in 2013, but be careful. Don't just subscribe to them because there may be some issues in their interpretation. And it's important, I think, for us to think about the role of our shelters and our communities to prevent these diseases, especially if we are getting the data that's telling us where to go do some work. All right? And with that, I really appreciate you staying. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>